here. Okay. So uh, tonight the program is the instructor becomes the student. And uh, it's been a long time since I've been a student pilot. It's been a long time since I had a check ride uh, in an airplane for anything. It's been even longer since I had a check ride for an airplane rating. The uh, last check ride I did was on my, for my flight instructor, a multi-engine rating. And uh, so this was a new thing on my pilot certificate. I haven't done that in a long time. I had to fill out Niagara for an ATP uh, certificate with a new type rating on it. And um, it's a lot of fun. So I thought I'd talk about uh, what it was like to re-enter that student mindset. Usually I'm over in the right seat with my clients and um, you're the one in the hot seat and I'm the one in the other seat who's just watching, observing, cajoling, distracting, all that stuff that instructors are good at doing. And uh, so it was kind of fun to put myself in the other seat and get a little reminder of what it's like when we do this. So uh, there's a shot of me in the, in the 787 simulator uh, at one of the classroom sessions there. I thought, I need a picture of me in this thing. And you'll see a lot more of these pictures as we go on. So I thought we'd talk about the student mindset. What, what inv what's involved in that student mindset? Talk a little bit about how we prepare for a training program like this. I'll talk a bit about the airplane here and there. I, I'm not going to get into great detail on it. I mean, we're going to try to keep this under an hour tonight. And uh, it took me a month after I'd already spent 20 hours uh, doing home study. We'll talk about that. So we're not going to cover the whole airplane. You're not going to walk away from this with a 787 type rating or training or anything like this. Just kind of a fun look at it. I'll talk about what the footprint of the training program was and uh, what happens next. I'm not completely trained yet. I've got the type rating, but that's just kind of the beginning of the end. And now we move on to the next phase. And I'll talk about what's involved with that. So uh, yeah, there's my new steed. Uh, there's a Dash 8 and a Dash 9. Uh, I'm qualified to fly them both. Uh, they serve slightly different roles, but largely the same, carrying passengers over tall buildings and, and continents and oceans. And uh, that's what's going to be my future here now, which I mentioned in a couple of years ago in, in an um, uh, article for our newsletter. And I, it's been just kind of waiting for this thing to happen. It's taken a little bit longer than I thought it would, but it's finally here. So every good flight starts with a passenger briefing. So here's our passenger briefing for tonight. This is our FAPA's first demo flight on this thing. So uh, please um, expect some mistakes in the tech. We're learning so far so good. Uh, we're gonna make sure this works and we might be experimenting with some other footprints in the future, some other uh, tools to use. We'll see what works best in time. So uh, have some patience, have a little sense of humor with us. And if you have any advice or tips, uh, type it in the chat there or email me or Jeff or Jim, and uh, we'll sort it out and, and consider what we're going to do next time around. So uh, thanks to Jeff Oslick for getting this set up again. Uh, he's been doing it a lot more with his kids in homeschooling, basically, and his business stuff. So he's the resident expert on it. I've attended a few webinars and, and uh, uh, meetings using Zoom but I'm not an expert by any stretch. So send Jeff a text or a chat in the chat box if you can figure out how to work that, if you have any issues and he'll help you out. Um, next thing is questions anytime. Uh, this is gonna get a little bit awkward. So normally when I give a presentation, I love the give and take of an audience in front of me. You know that, I, I, I really enjoy that part. It's gonna have to be just a little bit different tonight. So if you have a question, uh, Chat it over to, to Jeff there. He's going to be monitoring that. And from time to time, he'll pause me and jump in with a question that you've asked. And toward the end of the, the talk, we're going to go to a raise your hand thing. Uh, and if you have questions that way, then we can unmute your mic and bring you into the conversation. But to try to have people jump in and ask questions during the talk, I think it's just going to be a little bit too unwieldy. So we'll see how that works. And if it's too oppressive, if we don't like that, then we'll do something different next time. But for tonight, that's the rules of the road. Uh, also, uh, set your phasers on stun. Make sure you're muted. Jeff is going to keep an eye on that. And uh, so far, so good. Uh, we, we have the hammer, and we're not afraid to use it. So be ready for that. All right, so this all started with this email coming to me a couple of months ago that said, hey, you're going to go to 787 school. And here's the start date. And the next sentence there about this ethos distant learning, this is how we do most of our system study on the airplane. And I got a couple of screenshots on that a little bit later on. I'll go into greater detail. But so early February, actually in January, I knew I was going to get training. In February, I got the schedule for training. 
and uh, it started, as you can see, on March 21st there. And of course, the lockdown started happening that week. And so my wife and I were pretty convinced. I was pretty surprised that I didn't get a phone call that week saying, hey, uh, you know that training you were going to go to? And eh, never mind, we're not going to do that. Uh, but it ended up, I, I slid in just under the wire. Uh, as I was coming into the final week of training, uh, the lockdowns hit our training facility in Texas, and uh, the facility is now closed. So there's no training going on there at all. The way the program worked, since my type rating ride was last Tuesday, and because it was ahead of the closure date, I was able to finish. But I finished this phase. Like I said, there's still some more phases coming on that I haven't done yet. So uh, I'm kind of waiting for that schedule. I think it's going to happen in the middle of May that I should get the next part of the training, which is the international uh, procedures training that where we learn how to fly over across waters and, and over oceans. So that's down coming down the pike. Uh, so I started with that and I showed up at school on March 21st and they have a whole separate wing of the facility now is, is dedicated to 787 training. There's several classrooms, some simulator kind of facilities there. And of course, they welcome you in with a big, gorgeous picture of this thing. And just in case we forget what we're going to fly here. And uh, some of you probably have a whole lot more experience flying on a 787 than I do. I saw one once parked in, in uh, Chicago and I was able to sneak on. There was no gate agents. I, I pried open the door and I got onto it to look at it. But this was about a year ago. And of course, I had no idea what I was looking at. Now I kind of do. Uh, so, you know, the obligatory selfie in front of the wall there. And, you know, I, I can be a little silly from time to time. I like to like a halo around my head, you know, I like to feel like I'm special. So let's talk about this student mindset. And to me, there's a couple of elements to this, uh, things you have to keep in mind when you go into to learn a new airplane or learn a new any kind of trading training, whether it's for uh, a, just an endorsement for some new operating privilege or a new rating or a new certificate or whatever. A first thing is we're building on what you learned before. So unless you're a student pilot working on your very first certificate, you already know something. And we're going to build on that thing that you know and bring that with you into the new airplane. And we're going to teach you what's different on this one, uh, how it's the same and how it's different. Uh, for me, this program was pretty easy. I've been flying Boeing airplanes for 30 years. All of them have the flight management computers and Boeing builds a pretty good airplane and it flies real nice and there's a lot of similarities. So for me, coming from the 737, it was a small step for me. It wasn't a giant leap. And fortunately, my co-pilot was in the same boat. I was paired with a gentleman who lives in Northern Indiana. He's a farmer in Indiana, also runs some aviation businesses. He's got a business doing a photography of mostly agricultural and, and mapping kind of functions. Uh, and, but he's flown the 737 for the last couple of years. So we both were making a fairly simple transition. It was pretty easy for us. But as we understand that people who are coming from other airplanes, especially a non FMS type airplane, like a Super 80 or a DC-9, if that's what you're coming from, this is a lot steeper mountain to climb. You don't have the experience with the computer system. And that really is, is a lot of the effort that was spent in training was learning this new computer. Uh, even worse, sometimes it's for people coming from an Airbus because that is, while it's got a computer in it, it's completely different. So it's kind of like going from a PC to a Mac. It's just messes with your whole brain and you really have to learn how to do things in a different way. Uh, but the good news is uh, you'll learn, you have these instructors and these tools along the way that we're going to use to teach you how to do it. So uh, the next thing is, is to be humble. Uh, accept that you don't know everything you need to know. You're not the ace of the base anymore. You're just a guy. You're going to learn a new airplane. And uh, I don't know how this one works. Uh, you know, I've got some similarities I can take with me, but a lot of it's different. So uh, the instructor knows stuff and he's going to answer your questions. That's why you're here. You don't have to know everything when you get there. Um, but it really helps to be curious. If you're going to be asking questions along the way, you're going to try to build this understanding of the airplane along the way, it's going to be a whole lot easier and a lot more fun that way. Um, and finally, I think a little bit of confidence comes in there. You, what helped me was knowing that several hundred other pilots have already done this training successfully. They've learned how to fly it. They've gotten their type ratings. They're out there flying the airplane. So I have every reason to think that if all these other chumps can do it, that I can do it too. And that worked, up, it worked out quite well for me. Um, if it takes you a little bit longer to, to learn it, uh, it's okay. 
uh, some people take a little longer. I'm an older dog now than I was when I did my last type rating. Uh, it took a little longer to learn some new tricks, but I, I started out with a good foundation with the home study, uh, showed up with a lot of knowledge already in my back pocket. And then when it came time to start exercising this stuff, it was a whole lot easier than I thought. So, uh, and, and the old brain bucket's starting to fill up with a bunch of stuff. It's, there's not as much room for new stuff. So uh, it just, it's repetition and uh, get in there and get it done. So the preparation itself. Now this involves a whole bunch of flight manuals. Firstly, uh, we've got several books that talk about how the airplane works. Uh, here's, here's a front page of a lot of them. Uh, this is over 3,000 pages of material if I was going to print it all out. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of information. Uh, the good news is uh, things like that quick reference handbook over on the upper left corner. This is anytime a light comes on or a message pops up, this is our go-to. It's going to show us what, what to do to handle that message. We don't actually, in our training, go through every one of those. We go through a representative sample so we get used to the idea of how to do it. And, that, and then that idea, that experience that we're working on, on just the basics, translates into the, the, uh, the more advanced or, or the different stuff very easily. So, you know, for instance, uh, you can see the fire engine left and right. We don't need to do both left and right. We can do just one. The procedure is the same on the other one. Although <laughs> in training, we did them both multiple times. I, they they got to do something about the maintenance on those simulators. Everything kept breaking all the time. Um, the foundation of all this stuff is going to be checklists. And for those of you from your very first flight lesson, no doubt you were introduced to a checklist. This is the checklist that I got. Uh, this is one checklist. This is the only checklist we have. And believe it or not, we don't refer to a paper checklist. Uh, with one exception, I'll show you in just a second. This one is a reference card. It's not a checklist. This is for the flows. We, we've gone to a new system at work. We call it triggers and flows. So an event is a trigger, something that happens that's going to trigger us to do a flow and then, a, and then we'll do a back and forth with it. So this is, a, say, for instance, one trigger is we get to the airplane. It's the first time we're going to fly this airplane or, or before every flight. We're going to do a flow there that's the uh, before start um, pre-flight flow. And it's just an organized, systemized pattern through the cockpit that we check every switch and light and gauge and number and make sure everything's good. Uh, eventually, after you've done this a couple of times in the training devices, you get to where you can sit down and you can accomplish this flow in under five minutes and be ready to fly the airplane. Then we have a, uh, an actual checklist. I'll show you one of these in a little bit. Uh, and that's where we, we verbally validate or verify between the crew that we've accomplished these, these tasks. This is the one checklist that we do use. Now, we don't have memory items in this airplane, and it used to be called red box items or anything. No memory items. There are no time critical things that we have to do on this airplane. So uh, even an engine fire immediately after takeoff, we're not to do anything until we get at least 400 feet above the ground. The airplane is stabilized and everything's under control. We know where we're going. Then we can reach for that card and uh, say for an, in the event of an engine fire, there's a checklist on there with five items on it. That's what we do. And we do this very deliberately, very slowly, very paced. And uh, we're not rushing into anything. We have plenty of time to deal with this. So the next thing they send us is, a, is a cockpit layouts. And this is actually a photograph of a big gigantic sheet they gave me, which is the layout of all the panels in the airplane, the overhead panel, the front forward panel, and the lower panel. And it's just so you can kind of get an idea of where everything is in the airplane. And it looks like a lot of switches. It's not nearly as much as the 737 used to have. Uh, but the, the uh, electrical system is all on the left there. The hydraulic system is in the, the next column over from the, the left. Then we got the hydraulics and then we got the pneumatics. It's all very organized. And there's a few other bits here and there. Flight instrument displays, the forward displays, very similar to everything else I've been flying for the last 30 years. So that's easy. Center pedestal, kind of the same layout, you know, little tweaks here and there, uh, but it's enough to get us started with it. So armed with this now, I have a general idea of where to look for the controls that we're going to be training on for the rest of the program. So the program itself is, it consists of five phases of study. The first is a home study, and this is what they alluded to in that second paragraph of that email I showed you. 
Um, they give access to me on my company iPad for a program that is about 20 hours of home study on the systems on the airplane. So here's a, a couple screens that it shows. Uh, it goes into great detail on all the systems, the, the aircraft generals, the dimensions. Uh, this last one is the electrical system. So the first thing you have to do is figure out, okay, what worked on the last airplane? Is it going to work on this airplane? Is it not going to work on this airplane? And uh, in this particular case, it's a pretty involved electrical system. Uh, this is the first one I've flown that has a 235 volt AC electrical system. Everything else is 115 AC or 28 volt DC. And this one has the 235. The reality of it, of it is though, that when you operate the system, it's just switches and a couple of gauges here. So I don't need to get into the weeds. If I don't have a, a control or an indicator for that system, it's not really important that I spend a lot of time on it. So I need to know what happens that I have control over if something breaks and, and generally how things function. And that's the idea here. So then we move on to the classroom phase. And this is the phase that began March 22nd. We show up there in the classroom and the classroom consists of two of us. There's myself, my co-pilot and a ground instructor. And usually it's a captain and a co-pilot. That's the ideal setup. There are more co-pilots than captains on this airplane because on the long haul flights, we'll have three or even four co-pilots. So we have several more of those. You might end up with two co-pilots in training. And the worst case is you have a single pilot. Uh, it just, it's a whole lot easier to go through with a crew and it's easiest if you go through with a captain and a first officer and because you don't have to try to do the other person's duties. You just focus on what your duties are. It's a whole lot easier that way. Uh, so we move on to the classroom, and the classroom phase is a small room. Uh, this is basically the one training device in it. This is called the flat, the flat panel trainer. Two gigantic large touch screens connected to a computer, and they're touch screens. So it also depicts these control systems that we saw on that uh, aircraft layout diagram that they sent me. And uh, you can push the switches and things happen, but it's very basic, very, very fundamental. Um, and the the fact of the matter is we didn't use this at all in our training we had we great access to the next device i'm going to show you which was far more advanced than this and uh, so we ended up not using this at all instead we use this and this is a picture before we turned it on this is called a virtual procedures trainer and the, the vpt is a whole layout, you can see all these screens, they're more or less laid out in the orientation where the panels are situated in the airplane itself. So things that are on the overhead panel are gonna be above you. The co-pilot and I each have our seats and we have a little thr throttle quadrant in the middle there we can use and the, the keypad, keypads and mouse controls for the flight management computer. Uh, still, it's pretty primitive. Uh, it's, it kind of looks like a touch screen, it's, it's not really. Uh, and but it comes very close to emulating a lot of the things that the airplane is capable of doing. So uh, it, it's more than adequate to learn the basic techniques, the, the basic controls and flows and checklists. And um, it, it's you can't take it flying really. It's got the throttles and the, the speed brake controls and stuff like this. It's got a little tiny yoke on it, but we basically flew this on autopilot the full time. There isn't a real yoke and there's no visual, so you can't fly it outside. Uh, it's funny. Uh, Ken asks, where do you get one of those cool hats? Um, you got to become an airline pilot to get one of those. <laughs> Sorry. I earned that one. It's taken me a long time. So here's another picture of in front of the screens there. It's a little bit more blurry, unfortunately. So I spoke a little while ago about flows, and this is a diagram of the flows that we use. I mentioned that it was an orderly flow throughout the cockpit to check the position and indication of all the switches and, and lights and gauges on the airplane. This is the flow we use. And I teach, and uh, all the, the clients I fly with in my GA airplanes, to use the flow in your airplane. I use the flow in mine too. And basically I do this flow before, anytime I'm gonna transition from one phase of flight to another. So when I get in the airplane, before I'm ready for start, I do a flow. After I've started the engine, when I'm getting ready to taxi, I do a flow. When I'm out in the run-up area, I do another flow. After takeoff, I do another flow. Every half hour in cruise even, and Jeff will vouch for this. So I got a little reminder that pops up in the, the uh, 530 in our Cessna 182. 
It's a reminder to do this flow. Just check everything, make sure everything's okay. This is a great way, uh, if you're flying something like a, a Mooney or a Bonanza that's got selectable fuel tanks, you don't have a both, uh, use this as a reminder to check your fuel situation and change your tanks. So these flows are very useful and they back up the checklist. If you've done it with the flow, now the checklist is a true checklist and you're using it to check that you've done everything you needed to do. So the, the training sessions in these uh, programs were pretty intense. Uh, this is one for, for uh, day six of our ground school program. Uh, and this is the, this is the profile. Uh, we tend to do a four hour lesson in that visual procedures trainer or virtual procedures trainer. And this is a two hour segment. We would do two of these a day and we'd have a, a period one and a period two. And each period is designed to expose you to a certain set of circumstances and to make sure you knew how to deal with it. Uh, in this case, we were going up to, to 35,000 feet. We, we saw what it looks like if we suddenly were to get a, a severe damage on the engine. Let's say a fan blade decides to break loose or something. And now we have to turn around and divert. So that's all part of this, this uh, procedure. It's all a very scripted, very specific set of steps in every lesson. And uh, firstly, they're pretty crowded. There's not a lot of time to do a lot of extra things. They're pretty dense when we have to do all this stuff in this order. And the idea is that this is an approved training program. The FAA signs off on this thing and we'll verify that when we're done with this program, that we've attained all this knowledge and been exposed to all these things. And this is how we make sure we do it. So the third phase, then we move on to the simulator. And uh, this is kind of the, what everybody is waiting for, I think. You get into a simulator and these are very high level simulators. These are all level D simulators. These are actually certified not only to do a check ride in them, but we can, we can log landings in this simulator. And it's a legal landing for my currency. So now I'm multi-engine current uh, for landings. I uh, gotta double check to see that I'm single engine current. I, I might not be. But here's uh, what they look like on the outside. And uh, it's a beautiful work of art. It's, it's very sexy and curvy and large and smooth. And this is a very modern one. That you can see down there the legs that are holding it up are, are all, they're electric motors now. In the old days, they were hydraulic lifts that moved it around. They tended to be a little bit more jerky. They were noisier. They were high maintenance. These are all electronic now. They're very smooth, very quiet, and very realistic. And uh, this is another one. We, we have uh, this one, 787-4. We have five 787 simulators down there at the schoolhouse. Three of them are dash nines. I'm sorry, two of them are dash nines and three are dash eights. Very similar. There's just really one minor difference between the two from the cockpit point of view, uh, but very similar airplanes. For contrast, here's an older one. This is a 757 simulator. Uh, this is one I spent a lot of time in when I flew the 757, 767. Um, sadly, while I was down there, it was announced that we we're going to park our entire 757 and 767 fleet. So this simulator has probably already seen its last student uh, for American Airlines. It won't, won't see any more use. That's real sad. It was an amazing airplane that I really enjoyed flying. Great performing airplane. So there's the door. Of course, no beverages or food allowed in there. I had a, a bottle of water in my backpack and I had to leave that backpack outside the simulator. They're very strict about this. Too many stories of somebody accidentally spilling a, a cup of coffee somewhere and causing thousands of dollars or even in some cases could be as much as a million dollars of damage to one of these things. They're more expensive than airplanes in many ways, um, but it's an amazing learning tool. So one of these simulators takes a full room full of computers to run. Uh, they wouldn't let me in there. They don't let us pilots around that kind of stuff. It's it's too dangerous. We might break something. We might touch something. Uh, but that screen over on the right is one of the computers that's involved there, and that's the one that generates the visual representation that we have outside the cockpit. I'm going to show you some pictures of that here in just a minute. The visuals on these are truly amazing, and you'll see when we get to that part. Uh, this is another separate box down on the, the ground floor. This is the motor controller that runs each of those six motors uh, that, that control the motion on this thing. I have no idea how many watts of power are in that thing, um, but it's quite a lot. There's big wires that go from this over to the motors, and it's a lot of gear. 
So here's one of the visuals. Uh, this one is on that flight that I showed you the, the profile of. We were flying right by a big bear and uh, they we, he caused severe damage on the airplane. We had to return and divert to LAX. So we're turning around. This happens to be San Gorgonio. We're about probably six or eight miles east of San Gorgonio. Big Bear is on the right side of that. Just the level of detail in those mountains is astounding to me. And I really re regret when I was in the Boy Scouts that I didn't do the hike all the way to the top of that mountain. I'm gonna have to get back up there one of these days. But the visual is, is astounding. This one is, uh, uh, let's see, this is just east of JFK Airport. This is Jones Beach, New York. We were on base leg to final. You can just barely see Kennedy Airport up toward the, the top of that window screen off kind of on the right side. I posted this one on Facebook and I've got a friend who grew up on Jones Beach. And he chided me at first for posting this picture of Jones Beach and not telling him I was there. He, he didn't believe at first that this was a simulator visual, but that's all it is. And he said it was really remarkable how accurate that was. Uh, this is a shot uh, at gate B20 in Boston. When you pull into a gate, it even has a guide man there. That guide man, as you taxi into the gate, will give the proper marshalling signals and tell you when to stop. That's how detailed these simulators are. Uh, this is on final approach to runway 16 center at SeaTac. We did a lot of our, our engine out work at Seattle because it has so many runways. It was real convenient. And here's a daylight visual on the runway in Dallas on 17 right. Uh, looking through the head-up display so you can get a, start to get a feel for what that looks like. Notice that detail on the runway. You can see the cracks in the pavement. You can see the grooves on it. It's just that precise. It's really remarkable. And that, uh, oh, wait a minute, that's not a simulator visual. That's out the window of the schoolhouse. It was, we had one class. It was real gentleman's hours most of the time. We started about 9.30 in the morning every day, except this day where I had to walk over before sunrise. And it was a nice sunrise for Texas. I don't normally like sunrises, especially if they're in Texas, but this was a good one. So here's a view through the head-up display. And uh, I don't know if you're, you've ever seen one of these before, but it's basically a projection of your primary flight display right up over the real world. Airspeed tape on the left and altitude tape on the right, just like your G1000. And it's got the horizon line, it's got a DG down there, it's got course and, and altitude deviations, autopilot modes, the whole works. It allows us to fly the airplane extremely precisely and smoothly using that head up display. It takes a little getting used to, but I've been flying with it for about 18 years now. And um, this airplane is unique in that both pilots get one of these. I've been flying with one on the 737 for a long time. My co-pilot's brand new to it. So it took him a little bit longer to get used to flying with it. But by the end of training, he really liked it. And uh, he'll be using, a lot, using it a lot more on the line, I think. So uh, this is on the approach into one three left at Kennedy Airport. The detail in that housing down there is, is really amazing to me. Now we were taxiing out of Seattle one day and I, I remarked to the, uh, the Czech airman, I, I said, you know, they have all these other airplanes. You can see 757s and Airbuses and A310s and stuff in there. I said, you know what, they really need some cool airplanes in the simulator. I said, it'd be really cool if they put a Constellation in here or a Concorde or something. And the Czech Airman says, oh, hang on, I got something for you. He says, turn right here, taxi south a little bit. And we sh he showed us this. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's amazing. They got a, it's a CL-415, that fire by uh, bombing airplane. And uh, so CAE, who makes the simulator is a Canadian company and this is a Canadian airplane so I think there was they were kind of playing around with it but they got a sense of humor and uh, this one's for uh, Jay Bruce I don't know if you're dialed in but I took this picture one morning we're just coming up on Lake Washington and Seattle and there's UW down there on the shore of uh, Lake I think it's Lake Washington Jeff will correct me if I'm wrong I think he knows too but just beautiful simulation uh, graphics in there so here's uh, the first is this one a movie? No, this is, yeah, this is going to be a movie. This is the simulator in motion. And it's very subtle, but you can kind of just see it jostling around a little bit. I don't know what these guys were doing. It was really hard to tell what they were doing at any given moment, but it doesn't have to move a lot to give you a real sensation that you're flying. Uh, most of that movement is, is me moving the camera around. Uh, but just real subtle moves. Uh, this is probably on a climb out about to level off at altitude. Let's see here. Yeah, that's almost done. 
So this next one, I got this a little too late. And again, it's, it, I don't know what's going on inside, so I can't prepare and get ready. But I got out of the simulator and I saw them doing this. And it turns out this one is on a landing rollout. They've touched down and they're decelerating, probably on auto brakes right now. And eventually they, they turn off, they manually override the automatic brakes and turn them off. And then they go to manual braking. See if you can see when that happens. There, so they've gone out of auto braking and it stopped decelerating. Now they jump on the, the toe brakes, just like your little airplane. And here's the toe brakes. And it you know, throws everything forward and now it feels like you're stopped. And it returns back to, a, back to neutral there. So this next one, after they do a landing, normally there's a takeoff coming. So this was a takeoff and I don't know where they are, but you can see them, it kind of jostles side to side a little bit as they're taxiing onto the runway. And now in a couple of seconds, they get lined up on the runway. We're going to run the engines up to partial power. And then you'll see the acceleration really start in earnest. Part of me was kind of hoping this was going to be a rejected takeoff and you could see the instant stop. But I think this was a normal takeoff. So there we go. Pretty good acceleration at the beginning of the takeoff roll. And then the acceleration slows as you proceed down the runway for takeoff. And eventually it goes into just a normal kind of, uh, kind of climb out. So that's kind of fun. This is a, a picture of the inside of the cockpit finally. Um, we have five of these big gigantic screens and they're probably about that size uh, divided in half. You've got a, a primary flight display on the left, the center, uh, the inboard two. Uh, it can be divvied up a couple of different ways. In this particular case, the one on the left there is set up as a navigation display with kind of a plan view on top and a profile view on the bottom part of it. And then the lower one also can be split up. In this case now, my co-pilot on the other side has a checklist pulled up there, and I have a flight management computer pulled up on my side. Here's a close-up of the navigation display. So this is, if you phone a G1000 or something like that, you're used to seeing these pink lines and your fixes all the way around there. And you can see the compass rows. Uh, this is kind of the way I fly my 530. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you bring what, what you know already. So some of the stuff you've seen on other airplanes, you know how it works, you know what it looks like. So this is the commonality thing that you can bring to it. Um, we, this airplane has a new feature here. If you zoom down close enough on that navigation display, it'll display the taxi diagram. So in this particular case, we were, uh, it's on one six center. So we had just landed, we're about ready to turn off the runway. We can dial it down and you know, the, 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 where this really comes into handy is in abnormal operations, let's say, uh, we landed with an engine fire or something. We're going to stop on the runway. When we check in with ground control, we can say, okay, we're, we're stopped on runway 16 left, just north of intersection November. And now the, the crash trucks know exactly where to go. So the, the next thing we have is a bunch of synoptic displays. These are kind of just a big picture view of what the various systems on the airplane are doing. This one is the electrical system, and this is kind of normal operations. We've got two engines, each have two generators. And they're feeding all four of the main buses. Now we don't have external power or APU plugged in or the aft external power. Uh, right now it's shedding a couple of loads for some reason. I couldn't tell you why. Uh, but we got AC and DC, uh, and we've got two sets of batteries on there. They're both indicating the voltage. Uh, this one is a hydraulic system. We've got three different hydraulic systems, and uh, the left and right one are pretty low duty, not a lot of responsibility. Uh, the center one takes care of the landing gear and nose wheel steering and wing flaps, so it's a little bit heavier duty there. So it's got two, two big electric pumps in that one. Here's your fuel system. This is normal operations, both engines running, uh, no fuel in a center tank. Uh, we can get into some other situations like this one. Uh, we had the left engine shut down on this one. So and you can see the quantities are different now. The left tank has 18,000 pounds of fuel. The right tank has 15.3 burning on the right engine will drain that fuel out of the, the right tank. So if it, we can actually land this airplane with one wing tank full and the other one completely empty. That's legal. There's no, no legal maximum imbalance. 
uh, but it flies better if you have it more balanced. So this is balancing that fuel. Now here's an air system synoptic, uh, the air conditioning system pressurization. Uh, this airplane was unique in, in of the, uh, the jets that I've flown. Uh, most of them use a bleed air from an engine for air conditioning, for pressurization. This one doesn't. This one has four separate compressors that are electrically driven. So those are the compressors at the bottom. They feed into two packs. And from there on, the system is just like every other air conditioning system I've ever seen. Uh, the, the cabin occupants up there are 320, so this must be a dash nine. And the, the flight attendants can make some modifications back there to the pressurization and air conditioning system based on how many people are on board. Uh, here's our door synoptic. So right now all the doors are, are closed and armed. And this is probably taken in flight. On the ground, if any cargo doors or E&E &E doors, any access doors are open, we'll see a very different schematic. Tire pressures. We get tire pressure and brake temperature for every, every uh, tire. Uh, that right now the gear is up and the doors are closed, so everything's good. And here's our flight controls. We, we use uh, spoilers and flapperons for most of the roll control. The ailerons are only used at higher, uh, at lower altitudes and lower air speeds. At high altitude, it tends to be very sensitive in roll, so we just use the flapperons. Then you got the stabilizer and elevator for uh, pitch control in the back, and we got rudder. Everything's on there. Here's the, the uh, engine instruments, uh, just like every other engine instrument system I've been seeing. Normally when we fly along, we're, we fly with only the top four instruments are, are in view. Everything else is out of view. And if something goes wrong with it, they pop up. Uh, for instance, here's what it looks like when there's an engine on fire. Uh, the engine's still operating normally, but it's on fire. And we know that because of the red message and there's a light and a siren that go off when that happens. And the little box says we got a checklist to do. And here's the checklist. So the checklists are all done electronically on the, the, usually on that lower display. And the green things are things that are already checked off. Uh, in this case, the box that is highlighted there toward the bottom says, if on the ground, do not wait 30 seconds. If after 30 seconds, the fire is still, uh, message is still shown, then we're gonna fire the second bottle. If you look in the upper right corner, there's a, the colon 10. When we fired the first bottle, it started a timer. And that's that timer up there. It says we have 10 more seconds. If we're on the ground, we'd pull, we'd fire the second bottle right now. But if we're in flight, we wait 30 seconds because we want to, we need to make sure that it's, it's really out. We need that, we might need that extinguishment to last a little bit longer. So once we've waited that 30 seconds, this box will go away. And the next item down there, the left engine fire switch will be highlighted. And when we fire the other bottle, now that will be automatically checked off as having been completed. So here's the engine fail checklist, and it starts with trying to determine, okay, well, did you lose both engines? That's not this checklist, that's a different one. Or uh, did you notice a vibration in the engine or airframe? Uh, that's a different checklist, that's not this one. And if you think the engine fell off, that's another checklist. So use that one, not this one. So fortunately, uh, this stuff doesn't happen very often, but it's real important with these checklists that aren't on paper, they're buried in the computer. It's important to make sure you're doing the right checklist. Uh, this one, sorry, this is the best picture I could get. The, the simulator was in motion. My co-pilot was flying, and it was a little bit rough. He was all set up for landing approach. Uh, but here, the autopilot's disconnected. We have an engine shut down. we got a fuel imbalance. We have an auto throttle turned off. And the gear's down, and the flaps are down. So we're all set for landing. This is good. This is what we want to see on a, an engine out uh, landing situation. It's all good. So another visual here, actually this is a, gonna be a movie. This is landing on 17 Center at uh, SeaTac Airport. So our, our approach, oh boy, that looks a little bit jumpy to you, doesn't it? Um, the approach is a little faster. Our, our approach reference speed, depending on the weight and what's going on is about 155 to 160 knots, uh, depending on the weight. Uh, so we're solidly in the category D for, for approach categories. Um, it's not usually that green around SeaTac Airport, but that looks really nice. And that voice you can hear is the, the automated callouts letting us know as we're getting down toward the ground. Normally when we're at 20 feet is when we idle the engines and just think about lifting the nose a little bit and it flares for landing. 
So this must have been my co-pilot landing because there's no way I would have tried to video that while I was landing it. Yeah, he did a great job with it. He flies a Piper Cub at home. So I knew I was in good hands when it came to flying the airplane. So there's a, a view of my primary flight display and the navigation display. And you can just see just a portion of the engine instruments over there on the far right. So these periods in the simulator are highly scripted. And this was on day six of the, the simulator portion of training. And you can see this is a whole bunch of takeoffs and landings. We've got an engine failure happening basically on every landing or takeoff. Something is going wrong. We're just doing it over and over to build the muscle memory and the procedure memory on how to make sure the airplane is configured and set up to do whatever it is we're about to do. We, we do it by repetition. You just do it over and over until you get it right. So now the next, that at the end of that simulator phase is where I get my type rating check ride. And that was last Tuesday. Uh, the way it works is basically the check ride lasts about three days. The first day of these is called the maneuvers validation. And this is where they're checking out that we know how to get in and out of the, the whole, everything in the FMC, all the checklists, all the systems. We know how to run a representative sample of the, the non-normal procedures um, and demonstrate that we can do all this. Now, once we're done with all this, everything's breaking all the time and nothing's ever working right. Now we move on to find the airplane at normal operations. And uh, so we do what's called the loft, the line oriented flight training. And this replicates a couple of flights. Um, more things go right. We still get a couple of non-normal things that come up that we have to demonstrate that we can deal with. Um, so the next phase is gonna be this uh, international operations. Oops, I went just a little too far, the international ops. This is the part, this class was supposed to start on Sunday for me, but the, the training facility closed yesterday. So they said, and yeah, we're not even gonna bring you down for one day. We're gonna wait until we can get all five days in a row. And this is gonna be five more days of classroom time. And this is gonna be basically a half day each on flying across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, down to deep South America and uh, Far East stuff. Um, and then it's a full day in a simulator to demonstrate these techniques and practice a diversion. If everybody's going on the same track and you have a problem, you can't just descend where you are because there might be somebody right underneath you. So there's a procedure that we have to follow to get off of the track and descend to where we can then fly across the tracks and go to our diversion airport. And so we have to learn these techniques and then demonstrate them in the simulator. Once we're done with that international operations training, now I go out to the line experience. Uh, this is called OE, operational experience. And this is in the airplane. So my very first time I see the airplane is gonna be with a full load of unsuspecting passengers in the back who have no idea it's my first time ever in the airplane. And it's a great confidence booster if I were to tell them that. We tend not to dwell on that too much. Um, but of course, in the other seat is a fully qualified line captain and flight instructor, basically. And I'm sitting in the left seat as the operating captain. He's the pilot in command because he's qualified and I'm developing my qualification. The requirement is to do this for 25 hours. And because I've already got captain experience now, we can reduce that a little bit for every leg that I fly. Uh, but it's going to be probably several domestic trips and then one trip each uh, in each theater, one over the Atlantic, one over the Pacific, and one down to deep South America to demonstrate that I've learned all this stuff. So the airplane itself, uh, you've already seen a little bit of it. Uh, mechanically speaking, some of the systems uh, we'll touch on just a little bit more here soon in a little bit, but there's the mechanical aspects of it. How are the systems built? How does it work? What do you do if something doesn't work right? How do you know if it doesn't work right? So this is all what, the things that we're learning in the mechanical aspect of it. We get into the electronic aspect of it, electrical and electronic. I mentioned earlier the, uh, the flight management computers. These are basically the brains of the whole airplane. So you really have to know your way around this stuff. It's like when you, learn, when you first get your you know, GNS 530 or, or an IFD 540, something like this, your G1000, you start out doing the basics. You can tune a frequency and you can make it go direct to something. But at some point, and in the airlines, it's more critical, we have to know basically everything about this piece of equipment because it is so fundamental to the operation of the airplane. So we spend a lot of time on that. Uh, it's one aspect of it to learn how the electrical system works, for instance. Uh, this is basically the only diagram we have of the electrical system. So we can see we've got these various buses and we've got uh, remote, remote power distribution units. We've got 
uh, large motor control systems. We got all sorts of stuff all around the airplane. And uh, basically this is sort of the 30,000 foot view. When we get in the airplane operating it, we get down to our 2,000 foot view, and this is the synoptic we get in the airplane. So what this is telling me right now is that the left engine is running, it's providing power to the buses. The APU is also providing power to the buses, and the large mo motor power system is providing power down there to start the right engine, which is currently spinning. So when you're starting an engine, it, the load shed box there tells us that it's turned off some cabin loads and some miscellaneous heaters, some, uh, static temperature port heaters that sort of thing uh, so you might not be able to watch a movie in back while we're starting this engine uh, but that's what we need to know this is the indicating system for the electrical uh, portion of the airplane this is all we have so we don't have indication or control of the 115 volt system or the 28 volt system and then we have the human aspect of it and some of this applies to the GA world too. And I've been trying to get a guy to come in and, and basically give us a version of this lecture to our pilot group but about the pilot stuff. We look at things as threat and error management. Uh, we wanna always stay in that green donut as much as possible. If things are starting to go wrong, you might find yourself in the yellow or if things are going really wrong, you might be in the red. So your job is to get back into the yellow and ideally eventually back into the green. And these are the ways you do it. So for instance, that first little, those, those boxes that are lined up back there are the barriers that we have to prevent mistakes or to reduce mistakes, mitigate mistakes. And that first one there is policies, procedures, and flows. So for you in your airplane, a policy might be your personal minimums that you choose to use. And maybe this is, uh, you're gonna add uh, 1,001 to all your instrument approach procedure minimums, for instance. That's a policy that you establish. I really recommend that you write these down. If you don't write them down, it's too fungible. You can change it too easily. Make this part of your procedure. Obviously, checklists are a, an element of this. And el the idea of a checklist is to make it less likely that you'll forget something. You've got automation. The automation can be a big barrier if you can delegate the flying chore to the airplane while you sort something out. But this can also be a problem if you're not familiar and comfortable with how your automation works. It can be a bigger problem. It can be a distraction to you while you try to figure it out instead of having it be a tool for you to take care of flying the airplane while you have the, you build up that bigger picture. So this is kind of the model we use at work. Uh, the Czech airmen love to hear it on the check ride when everything's going good or uh, you know, maybe even we've been in the yellow, we had an engine catch on fire or something. So we split up the crew and, and he goes off and does his thing and I do my thing. When we get back together, uh, we say when we're in the green, we're good to go on to the next thing. And so it's a constant effort to stay in the green. So for me, what happens next? Uh, as I mentioned, this international school is the next thing. It's currently scheduled for the middle of May. They may or may not decide to put me in the airplane on some domestic legs. We are flying it daily from uh, Los Angeles to Dallas right now. So they could have me do one of those flights. Um, we also fly it to Honolulu. We, we fly a freighter turn every day to Honolulu. I can't get that flying because number one, I'm not qualified yet to go across the Pacific, uh, but it's also very senior flying. They don't stay in Honolulu. They just fly there and they come right back. So they don't have to deal with the hotel or the quarantine or anything. So it's 11 hours of flying in a duty period, but I'm gone from the house for 13 or 14 hours. So it's a good deal, but eh, I can't get it right now. Uh, the operating experience is what's coming after the international school. I'm gonna get in the airplane with this Czech Airman like I talked about. And then once I've completed that OE with this Czech Airman for as much as 25 hours, now I go into what's called restricted captain status. And this lasts 100 hours. And what I have to do during this period is add a hundred and a half to actually 200 and a half to all my minimums. So even the best ILS approach I can, I can fly instead of being 200 and a half. Now I need to have 401 as my minimums to do that approach. There are some exceptions built into the system. Um, but this is something you can do and you should do when you get new avionics in your airplane too, until you get comfortable with how that IFD 540 works in your airplane, you need to probably think about, raising your own personal minimums a little bit until you get comfortable with it where you, so that you can operate it, get in, make it do what you want it to do and get out very quickly and very efficiently. After I've done that 100 hours, 
uh, oh, and another thing that happens in that, that 100 hours is that I cannot be paired with a low time first officer. So one of us has to have more than 75 hours in the airplane. Uh, if we both are paired and, and we both have less than 75 hours in the airplane, then they have to replace one of us. Uh, if I was on a, a long haul crew where I have a two or three co-pilots with me, and if one of them has more than 75 hours, then we have to do a swap and they have to trade into the pilot seat and they have to do the flying. So now, once I have over 75 hours and I can fly with any co-pilot, I have over 100 hours and I'm fully qualified now, I can go all the way down to an auto land. Uh, the airplane will, will automatically land itself um, with an engine out and certain other malfunctions going on uh, all the way down in, in certain airports, I can do it as low as 300 RVR. So think about what that visibility is, 300 feet. If you're sitting on a runway, the edge lights are 200 feet apart. So this means if I'm parked to beam one set of edge lights on that runway, I can see down to the next set of, of edge lights and halfway to the, the one after that, that's 300 feet. And there's no decision altitude, there's no minimum. So I can land without seeing anything on the runway as long as the RVR is reporting 300 feet. There's about five or six airports that, that it, I can land at 300 feet. The rest of them at 600 feet. That's still pretty low. Uh, so at that point, then I'm fully qualified. I can take the airplane anywhere in the world into any weather conditions. So um, that is what I've got for the presentation thing here. I've already answered one question I saw in the chat. And if we want to try to, we're just about an hour in. Look at that. I nailed it, an hour. And uh, if anybody has any questions about what this training was like, anything else, uh, GA, uh, airline, whatever, raise your hand. Uh, you probably have a button on your computer to raise your hand. And if you do that, uh, between Jeff or I, we'll get you unmuted. And uh, we can try to address some questions. And... Uh, if there's no questions, then we'll move on to the next thing. So, yeah, I see Jesse's got a question here. So let's unmute him, see if that worked. And you should be live. What's your question? Question, sir, about the, uh, the air system in an aircraft, uh, especially okay. with the COVID-19. Um, is the air purified now? Are there any issues uh, with the air being, I, I guess, is it filtered somehow? That's my question. That's a, a great question. I'm not surprised we got one of those. Thanks for asking it. And we asked it in training too. And I was told we do have HEPA filters on board, the high efficiency particulate something or other filters. Um, one of the instructors told us at one point that the, these are basically operating room quality filtration systems. So the, the air that gets filtered through this system is as clean as that in an operating room. Uh, some of it is recirculated, though. It's not 100% recirculated. I never could get an exact number on how much of the air was recirculated. I'm led to believe it's somewhere on the, on the order of about three-quarters of it is recirculated, and that just helps with the efficiency of the whole system. And, and the recirculation system also plays into some of the equipment cooling systems, so we do have to leave it on all the time. Uh, but we've been modifying some of our uh, procedures over the last couple of weeks and months to to keep it clean uh, to maximize the efficiency and amount of the airflow coming into the airplane so thank you that answers your question yes sir and uh, I see Torger's hand up what do you got Let's see if we can unmute him Jeff can you try that I tried it and it didn't work Right again. Oop, I think we both did it. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, good. Hey, Mike, uh, thanks for doing this. But let's see, uh, a question for you. The, I noticed in your picture, you got an iPad sitting next to you in the cockpit. What, what, yep. what's, the, what's the relationship there? How do you in, integrate that into your, into your flying? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. There's actually a, a built-in EFB that's part of the airplane. And uh, it was, again, part of our training. We can pull up uh, approach charts, procedure charts of all types, uh, uh, SIDS and STARS, and, and we can actually use it also to, to calculate performance. But we also carry our iPad, and this is the company iPad. Uh, here's, here's my company iPad. So I carry this from airplane to airplane. And the way we integrate this in um, is in a couple of ways. First of all, all of the manuals for the airplane. I, sh I showed you those uh, seven or eight manuals before. We carry all of those 
on the iPad. So if I needed to refer to some sort of document to get some information about a system or a performance or what have you, then uh, I go into the iPad for that. I can also use it for taxi diagrams. Uh, if you saw Barry and Brian Schiff's uh, program the other night on runway incursions, Brian showed a, a taxiway diagram that was computer generated. That's the sort of thing we do on the iPad. So we use them both sort of to a certain extent interchangeably. Uh, we have performance data on both. Um, there are some pluses and minuses to using the performance data on the iPad versus using the, the EFB that's built into the airplane. Uh, the iPad is a little bit easier, but it's bigger numbers. It's rounder numbers. The, the uh, OPT, the operational performance tool on the airplane is more precise. So, you know, if, if you have to get down to just the, the nats behind to get exactly the right number, go to the built-in thing. Yeah, um, but gotcha. they're both there. They both provide us usable data that we use in all phases of flight. Okay, and another question for you. I, sure. I noticed, I, I've always been curious about the flow control versus the checklist. After you go through the flows, do you then just pull up the checklist and make sure you've done the flow correctly? How does that work? Yeah, we do it as a flow and then check as opposed to a do list. And a lot of what we use in the GA airplanes is a do list. You read one item, you do that item, and then you go right. to the next item. And in the airplane, we'll do a flow where we, we have this organized pattern of switches that we do, and then we use the checklist just to, to look at it. And we're not actually changing the switch at that point. We're just checking that we set it correctly the first time. Okay, and, and do, you, do you, does a co-pilot acknowledge do you go back and forth to the co-pilot acknowledging switch on, switch off? You know, is, is that done? Um, it, yes and no. It kind of depends. We have a couple of different ways that we do these. Some of these are silent checklists. For instance, the after takeoff checklist is essentially all automatically accomplished by the airplane. The, the checklist system that's built into the airplane can sense whether certain things have been accomplished. So, for instance, it knows that the gear is up. It knows that the flaps are up. Uh, but it doesn't know that the APU is in the, the proper setting. Uh, oh, maybe okay. we want the APU on if we're an engine out. So uh, when you go to the after takeoff checklist, it says gears up, flaps up. Uh, there's something else on the checklist. I forget what. And those are all three already checked off as having been accomplished. And then the one that's left unchecked is the APU as desired. So he'll look at it and say, okay, we, APU is off. We don't need it. Or it's an on and we do need it, whatever it is. And then there are other checklists that are a back and forth. Every item is read. The, the uh, before takeoff, uh, before start checklist is that way. We read everything back and forth. So some of them are independently com confirmed and some are not. Let's see. Now, Ken's got his, uh, Ken's iPad has his hand up. Uh, hey, yeah, Mike. Uh, that was a very professional uh, presentation. I think if you ever grounded, you could have another uh, career. <laughs> so I appreciate Thanks. it. My question is, how did you get those uh, really great photos in the simulator? They look, looked uh, like, like they were pre-planned. Uh, were you just <laughs> flying and, or your co-pilot flying and you snapped photos? Yeah, we were just you know, accomplishing whatever and, and we're both in the green and everything's kind of calm. The, the checklist is done for the moment. And I thought, hey, this is kind of cool. Let me grab a picture. And I just took a picture. Uh, some of the ones looking at the screens, I, I had to take a moment and make sure that the, the flash was turned off. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, when you get the gear and the flaps down, the whole simulator vibrates a little bit to give you the simulation that you're in the airplane and the gear's down, you get the air drag on it. Um, some of those I, I'd have to take several times and I'd get a couple of blurry ones and then maybe I'd get one that was still. I've got a surprise video here for you in a moment where we just flew the simulator with the motion turned off. So those ones came out a lot better, but it was kind of funny. There was, were a couple of points where the Czech Airman, the instructor in the back of the sim, I'd, I'd whip out my phone and take a picture and he'd say, well, you know, you must be doing okay if you got time to take a picture. <laughs> so, so I kind of made it fun and I wanted to take a little, a nice variety of pictures that would, would try to illustrate and give you a flavor of, of the various things we were looking at at various phases along the way. So. It sounds like I accomplished that. So yeah, thank thanks. you. Thanks, I appreciate the kudos. And uh, Frank is next. You're up. Yeah, I understand. We're getting one of those for Papa. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's on order, but right now there's about a, a year and a half delay waiting for the uh, the COVID nineteen to be over with. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I guess the so, same situation uh, is for the one that we we do have somewhere, right? There's yes. There's, thank you uh, so much for bringing that up. Uh, this is a we a member donated a. In fact, was that you? No. Okay, there, a member donated a, a simulator to us, which we have set up at the airport. And uh, I've been tasked with working up the, the procedures that we're going to use to do it. We're almost there. Uh, and then I went to training. So I, I kind of had to take a, a month off know from what, it. Do you know what model that is? Uh, it's a Redbird TD2, which is configured okay. basically as a, as a retractable 172. Um, okay. I, honestly, I don't remember if it has a propeller control, but I know it has a gear control that you can use if you want. Um, and... It's a G1000. Uh, we, we don't have yet, but we're probably going to get the addition to it that allows you to connect your iPad to it. So it'll be a great tool to use for learning how to use for flight in your iPad in the airplane. So stand by. Now that I'm back in town, we've got a small committee that's working on that. I know uh, Chris is helping me out with that. And we hope to bring that online here in the next couple of weeks and months. Uh, you, you won't be able to use it to do an IPC in, uh, but you can use it to log approaches uh, and holding and course intercepts for your currency. So uh, AOPA has got a, an effort right now to try to make that better so that we can use it for an IPC, but the way it's written right now, we can't. So that's coming soon to a simulator near you. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much. Cool, thanks. And uh, Michael Rogers is up next. Hi, Michael, how are you doing tonight? I think we both muted again here. Unmute you. Okay. You're on. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go right ahead. Hey, Mike. Thanks for doing this. Um, you know, what you're training and what you're doing is so um, in depth as far as your, the professionalism expected of you. And I try to carry that forward in my work in my Mooney. I know you do. Alone. And you've kept me accountable on a lot of the things that we've trained together on. How, what's your mindset stepping into the airplane from on a general aviation uh, uh, approach? Because so many times I hear pilots on frequency and just some are so professional and sound so great and are so thorough and prepared and others aren't. What's your suggestion as far as carrying our limited knowledge in what we're doing and getting the mindset that a pilot like yourself, a captain would have, so we can emulate that a little bit. I think the first thing is you have to remember that you're in command of an airplane, that it's a deadly weapon. You know, you've got passengers on board, you've got people out outside, they're all counting on you to be your best every time you fly that airplane. And part of that is to fly and talk and be professional um, in every way that you can. I talked a little bit earlier about the, the policies, which in the GA world, uh, I always suggest using something like personal minimums. Um, everybody tells me they have personal minimums, and then I ask them, well, do you have them written down yet? And they tell me they don't. And this is something, you know, our, our minimums at work are printed. They're in that one of those books I showed you. And I don't have an option about those. I must respect those minimums. And that kind of a respect for the minimums engenders a respect to the airplane and your crew and your passengers and the team around you, everybody. We all look and sound better when we each fly better, I think. And uh, I try to keep that in mind. As far as flying the airplane, I try to fly my 182 the same way I fly my, my uh, 737 or my, um, or, or my 787. Um, I bring, I want to fly smoothly, competently. I want to be ahead of the game. I want to know what the next couple things are that's happening. And I don't want to be surprised. I've written articles on this before that surprises are meant for birthday parties. They're not meant for airplanes. <laughs> so part of that is to be up to speed on what's happening. If you're being caught by surprise in your airplane, then you're in that red zone. And so you have to take a look. In the moment, you've got to figure out how to get yourself back into the green. Um, and then when you're done with the flight in your, your recap, your analysis of the flight, you need to think about how did you get into the red to begin with and how can you prevent that from happening next time? 
And that'll keep you from getting into the red. And maybe next time that happens, you only get into the yellow, for instance. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a way that helps. And I, I get a couple of uh, a question here that's related to this. Um, Derek says, my minimums change based on my comfort level and recency of IFR. Absolutely right. I, I agree with that concept completely. Uh, I don't know the number offhand, but the FAA has an advisory circular, I believe, or, or maybe it's some sort of a publication on personal minimums. And I think AOPA has done this as well. And they talk about exactly that. Maybe your minimums go down oh. in, the more often you're flying. If it's been a month since you flew, maybe you're not ready to do a 200 and a half ILS approach. Maybe you better raise it by 100 or you know whatever it is. Um, but make this part of your procedure. Have these written down. Um, and AOPA, again, has, has a great exercise on this. It's been a while now since I've looked at it. But the idea is, how long has it been since you've had training, uh, since you've done takeoffs and landings? Uh, how old is your last flight review or your last wings phase? Are you wings current right now? Uh, all these things are to the good, and they will uh, make you a, a better, stronger, more confident pilot and maybe drive you toward lowering your minimums a little bit. But you know, right now we're in a phase where it's harder to fly. It's harder to fly with an instructor. I've, I've had a couple of clients contact me just in the last couple of days and I'm not going outside and flying right now. So uh, the, the result of this is a lot of us in the GA world are gonna be getting less, uh, less comfortable, less current. Um, and so we're gonna have to take a hard look at that. Uh, it's absolutely right. Does that answer, answer your question, Michael? Oh, I see you muted yourself again. That's fine. Um, so we had a question on the dash numbers. I, I mentioned dash eight and dash nine a couple of times. Um, this is like in the, the, uh, the 747, they started with a dash 100, and then they made the dash 200, then they made dash 300 and 400 and all these. So each of these now is a dash number. And I think they were catering to the Chinese when the, the very first model of the 787 that came out was a dash eight. Eight is a very fortuitous number in the Chinese culture, very lucky. So they wanted to start with the Dash 8. Um, and that was the first, it's a smaller version of it. The Dash 9 is slightly larger. I think, believe it's a 20 foot plug in front of the wing and after the wing, so more seats, a heavier airplane. The Dash 8 for us at a maximum takeoff weight is 502,500 pounds. And the max takeoff weight for the Dash 9 is 565 uh, and higher landing weights as well. So um, there's some different parameters to the Dash. It's just a different size of the airplane. And let's see. Oh, Jay Mason's here. Hi, Jay. Uh, the cabin compared to Anne Hunter after the publishing minimum, that's a 50, 100% increase. Yes. Good rules. That, yes. The whole idea of adding personal minimums there, um, it, it's a, actually, it's a 100% increase. If the old minimum was, was 100 and uh, 200 and a half, and we're adding 200 and a half to that, basically, it makes it 401. So we double our minimums. And yes, uh, there will be times when this might make it so that I can't do the flight. If, if I'm not current, if I don't have those, uh, those hours and that experience, um, then we have to delay the flight or I might even have to divert to the alternate. Uh, but that's what happens until I get the experience. So let's see, I see Tom's got a hand up here. Tom Moss, one of our board members. Go ahead, hey, Tom. Mike. Hey, how you doing? Listen, great job tonight on the presentation. And I think this format worked out really well. So thank you for and thanks to Jeff Oslick for putting this together. Quick question for you, Mike. Um, sure. You know, moving up to the 787. Um, so your 737 uh, currency and experiences, does this mean you will no longer be flying a 737? Will you no longer be current, or will you maintain that currency? Yeah, we're qualified on one airplane at a time. And uh, so right now I'm not current on the 737, so they can't even send me back to the old fleet and go fly that. Um, you know, we got a lot of weird stuff going on. We, we had 800 people take an early retirement. We had 5,000 pilots take a temporary leave here. Uh, there's rumors going around in October, we may be furloughing. So I could get displaced off of this airplane and have to go back to the 737. Uh, hmm. If that should happen, then I would have to go back and do a requalification course on that because I did the, the toilet bowl flush, kafush on all the 737 <laughs> stuff when I showed up to 787 school. So uh, if I have to go back to the 737, then yeah, I'm going to have to go kafush on all my 787 stuff and refill it with the 737 stuff. Oh, yeah, my we fly word. one airplane at a time. I hope it works out well for you, Mike. Yeah. 
Uh, me too. Thanks. <laughs> so my dilemma is, is if I end up getting displaced, I, I'm near to the bottom captain on the 787. I have two pilots junior to me. Uh, whereas on the 737, I was number 14 out of 270. So I was very senior mm. on that. So my dilemma is if I can't do the 787, I have a choice. I can go back to the 737 or I might even choose to do 777. And go, I'd have to go through another full month long qualification on that airplane. And I've flown the 777, but that was 20 years ago. And I really don't remember much about that. Mm. Even what I did remember, it's there's a lot of similarities from that to the uh, 787. I really found it helped a lot. Sounds so, great. Uh, Thank you. Let's see. Uh, Derek's got his hand up in the chat box. I can see Jeff. Can you find him and unmute him? And uh, Gandhi has a question. Why don't you unmute uh, Jim first? And uh... okay, I can unmute him. I've got him right here. Jim, you're up. Okay, Mike. Hey, thanks so much, uh, buddy, for taking the time to uh, to uh, get us this information. Great job, excellent presentation. So, my question to you thanks. is: Send money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a fixed income, brother. <laughs> oh yeah, forgot about that. <laughs> um, my question to you is: No matter who the pilot flying is. If you get a master caution light or an, an emergency of any kind, does the captain take over as the pilot flying and shed the checklist and other duties to the non-pilot flying? Or what, what do you guys normally do in that procedure? Or, you know, you're, you're rolling down the runway and you have an engine failure. Who, who actually does what and how do you orchestrate that? Yeah, that's another great question. I meant to put some notes in there on that. And some of it's up to the pilot, but the general consensus is when something happens, a light comes on, a message pops up, an engine quits, whatever, whoever is flying the airplane keeps flying the airplane. So our procedure is that if, if it's my leg to fly and I'm flying the airplane, I say my aircraft. And this does a couple of things. One, the main thing is it gets into my head that I'm flying the airplane. That's my sole responsibility right now is to keep the greasy side down and keep this thing under control. So there's no question about who's flying the airplane. Even if the autopilot's on, I'm controlling it. I have this. Now, the other pilot over there, the non-flying pilot, is going to take a look at it and say, okay, what do we have? We have an engine fail. Now we got a couple of choices. Actually, believe it or not, an engine failure is not an emergency in our airplane. It's just a non-normal procedure. But the general consensus is I keep flying the airplane. The other pilot is going to do enough of the checklist to stabilize the situation and get us to a point where we can think about it a little bit. And then the guidance, the preference is to delegate the flying of the airplane to the first officer. Let the first officer take care of the aviating and the communicating. And, and fly the airplane. Now, as the pilot in command, as a responsible person on the flight deck and, and the, the HMFIC, if you will, I'm available to step back just a little bit and take a bigger picture look at what's going on. I got a bunch of communications things I need to do. I need to make sure that air traffic control knows what's going on so that we're the immediate tactical situation is, is handled and that he knows what's going on, he knows what we need, and we're working in that direction. Uh, the next thing is I got to talk to the flight attendants in back because they might be they might be having a, a darkened uh, cabin in certain situations. They'll load shed the cabin lighting, for instance. Uh, it might turn off all the passengers' computer screens, so they uh, they know something's up if they don't see the screens anymore. Uh, so I'm going to start getting questions. I, I got to have some answers for the flight attendants. Right next to that is I'm going to get on the PA and I'm going to reassure the passengers. Say, hey, is Captain Josh speaking here? We've got a problem going on with one of our engines here. It looks like we're going to have to return to Boston. I'll be back with you in just a minute when we get it all sorted out. And um, it never mentioned, there's a few words you never say. We're never going to say tornado. We're never going to say lightning. We're never going to say fire. We're never going to say crash. <laughs> you know, some things like that that are going to make people sit up in their seat. We don't like to do that. Um, now, we, we, the way we remember it is we have two outside and two inside. So I've talked to the two inside, the flight attendants and the passengers, the two outside are air traffic control and company dispatch. 
if we're going to divert, I need to send a message to dispatch to tell them that we're diverting. So now I've taken care of all that. Now I go back to my co-pilot who's been flying the airplane and I'm doing the checklist and okay, I'm back with you. Where are we? What's going on? So he's going to tell me, okay, I worked on, we're, we're getting vectored to the, the ILS to this approach. I've got it pulled up in the box. It's ready to go. I've got the chart here. I'm ready to brief you on the procedure. I just need you to look up the, the landing speeds for this configuration, you know, with flaps 20 instead of 25 or an engine out or, you know, whatever it is. So we do divide and split the crew for a moment for a portion of this and take care of our respective duties. And then we come back together and land the airplane together as a crew. And let's see, I did see some text in here. Uh, Nate, I got your question here. We'll come back to that in just a second. And uh, yeah, oh, cool. Well, thanks iPad 6, I'm glad you enjoyed the talk so far. I did, it was kind of fun. <laughs> Working all the last couple of days putting it together, but I think it came out okay. Uh, so let's go to Nate's. Oh, okay, I, we get, did we get to Derek? No, we didn't. Can you unmute okay. him? And Yeah. So uh, Derek, hit us with your question. Go ahead, Derek. Is he unmuted? Oops, uh, he went away. Oh, he went away. Uh oh. Sorry, Derek. Yep. Oh, no, there he is. I see him. He's unmuted. Oh. You there, Derek? Yeah, maybe he's got some sound things there. So, uh, Derek, just raise your hand or fling another text message in there if you uh, come up with your question. Uh, see, let's see, John B has got a hand raised and then Samara has her, her hand raised also. So, uh, John B, go ahead. Earth to John B, can you hear me now? <laughs> I'm not hearing anybody, are you? I'm not hearing John. Okay. Now you might be unmuted. Maybe you have the wrong microphone selected on your set. This is part of the tech issue there. Yeah, you can go ahead and type a chat message, a question to us as well. If okay. you're having trouble and with the let's, mic. Let's see if we can get Samara unmuted. Uh, I see you there. And Samara, I can't unmute you. You might have to unmute yourself too. There you go. Okay. You look okay. unmuted now. Go ahead. So I have a, um, my, my question is around, um, uh, around when, um, if you're flying with another um, pilot, say you're either flying in their airplane or you've rented an aircraft together and um, a pilot briefing as to who's responsible for what in case of an emergency. Um, I know that you, you fly with other uh, with clients, people that uh, own aircraft or getting checked out in their own aircraft. How do you handle um, the um, who's responsible for what an emergency? Um, it's always smarter, I know, to do that on the ground and have a full pilot brief. But um, you know, if you have it's uh, the owner's Mooney and they have twenty five hundred hours in, in their own Mooney um, versus someone that has five hundred hours but uh, say that the, the owner hasn't flown consistently in the last two or three years. And um, you have, do you kind of, when you do your pilot brief, do you tell them, um, you know, I'll be PIC on this or when I'm doing my BF, BFR, like whose responsibility it is in case of an emergency? Absolutely. I can't emphasize that strongly enough. A before flight briefing on who's doing what and I include, okay, do you want me to work the radios? Do you want me to work the navigation while you fly? Um, you know, and exchange of control of the airplane is one thing. Your aircraft, my aircraft, my aircraft, that sort of thing. That's, that's critical too. But even, even the fundamentals, part of my briefing when I'm flying with somebody and, and those of you on the call here who I've flown with before can attest to this, I say, look, this is your airplane. You fly the airplane as if I'm not here. Just pretend I'm not here. Do all the stuff you normally do. Um, I'm not going to take control of the airplane unless I think you're going to kill me or unless we do the, the proper three-step exchange of control. I try not to take control uh, in any other circumstances. It's kind of inevitable. It happens from time to time. Um, but back to my, my mantra I mentioned earlier about surprises are meant for birthday parties, not airplane flights. 
you don't want a surprise in the airplane about who's doing what. And I've had clients before uh, where, for instance, uh, one, one gentleman, I was teaching how to work at 530. And I'm a compulsive knob twiddler. I think that's what I like about being a pilot is I got tons of knobs I get to twiddle. Uh, I've done this all my life. My dad called me that when I was little, and, and I, I think he was very right about that. So I have a habit of, of poking around in the 530 from time to time, maybe a little bit too much. And I was flying with one gentleman. Every time I get on the 530, he would stop whatever he was doing, including flying the airplane, and watch me do what I was doing. And so the airplane's going veering off in some weird direction because he's not flying the airplane. So part of my briefing is, hey, from time to time, I might not need to get in the navigator to go check something or you know, get a little piece of information, but I'll put it back where it was when I found it. So just ignore me. If I need you to look at what I'm doing, if I, if I want to show something to you, then I'll let you know. So there's just so there's no surprises. Let's see. And Jeff, I was trying to get it into speaker view here. Jolie recommended if we do speaker view, when somebody else talks, they, they would show up on the screen instead of my ugly mug. Yeah, I was having a little difficulty switching it back to that. So um, yeah. we haven't mastered that. Um, let's see. John Baker just joined us. Uh, let's see. So Derek's question was, it's down there in the chat box if you want to read along with me. Yeah, there's different elements of, he's talking about personal minimums and whether ceiling or visibility or something else. And you know, when we talk about personal minimums, we tend to think in terms of ceiling and visibility only. But what about runway length? What about crosswind? What about headwind, tailwind, even slope? What about busy airspace? If you live in Nebraska and you're coming here to LA, maybe your personal minimum is you don't want to get near the, the class Bravo. That's a type of a personal minimum. So whatever the kind of minimum is, it's best to document that. And that's one of the things that's in that, I think it's an AC that the, the FAA puts out on personal minimums. I, I know it's in the document that AOPA uh, did. It talks about a lot more than just ceiling and visibility. Any of these things could be your personal minimums and they're all legitimate. Let's see. Well, that's all the questions I see here. Do we have... Let me get back up here. I don't see John Baker's got a hand raised. Okay, yeah, uh, you're on, John. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh, awesome, awesome. Excellent presentation. I, I, I this is the first time I've ever seen an airplane system up close, so I really thank you for that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still haven't seen it up close. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, quick question: um, With the uh, COVID nineteen restrictions now, with the reduced number of flights that are going out now, there's, there's much less jet traffic. I assume there's much less pilots, uh, aircraft pilots that are flying. Uh, how are how is everyone how are aircraft kind of keeping currency and are your minimums going to change or can everyone use simulators do they count as keeping your minimums current in the, the airline world is one thing and for us our minimums don't change once we complete that 100 hours of, of restricted captain time then we're fully qualified day or night all weather conditions everything um, and now we, we go through additional recurrent training every nine months. So once we pass that nine month point, now we're not current. We have to do that training. Um, we actually, the landings do have the 90 day thing. So in, in the 787, I'll have the same three landings in 90 days that you guys have, that we all have in our little airplanes. So uh, this is a problem for us on these long haul flights. I fly from LA to Sydney. It's, it's 30 hours of flying both ways. And we do that, I think it's three times a month. Don't quote me on that. Um, but there aren't many landings and we have three co-pilots and one captain on board the airplane. So only two of us are going to get a landing. Two of them aren't. And if you run out of landings, then we send you down to the schoolhouse and we give you a landing simulator and, and reestablish your currency, your landing currency that way. In the GA world, it's, it's a lot trickier. It's a lot more based on the honor system. You have to be an honorable pilot. I mean, after all, you are a pilot. So we know that you can read, speak and understand English and you're a a fine, upstanding, law-abiding citizen, so you're always going to abide by these rules. And if not, you need to know you need to know how to know that you're not, and then you need to know how to get current again, whether that's calling me or some other instructor and, and going to do some instrument work or landings or what have you. You need to know how to regain your currency. Uh, as far as, as instrument currency, simulators, yes, they, they do count, and a 
and AATD or BATD can be used to log approaches, not circling approaches, and you can't log landings, uh, but you can log approaches, you can log holding, you can log course intercepting and tracking. So you can maintain your IFR currency with that. Now, I was just having this conversation with one of my clients. Uh, he wants to get in the airplane. Uh, he really likes to do the work in his airplane. He's got a beautiful airplane, uh, an Avidyne IFD 540 and a, and a nice autopilot, ballistic parachute, and a, the whole works on a 182. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, but he wants to do it in the airplane because currency is not enough for him. He wants to be proficient. So the only way he can really get proficient is to do it in his airplane. So, you know, maybe there's a space for a little bit of it in a simulator. There are tremendous advantages to the simulator. I showed you those, uh, some of the profiles that we do in the simulator. Tremendous advantage in a sim. You don't have ATC barking at you. You can't do this. We need you to do that. Um, how many times do, have I set up an instrument flight with some of you from time to time? And we set up a plan. Okay, we're going to do this approach at that airport. We're going to go missed. We're going to go to that airport and do that approach. And then we get up there and ATC is having none of it. We can't do any of it. So we have to change our, our plan on the fly. And it's really a pain to do that. That doesn't happen in a simulator. So there are tremendous advantages in a simulator, but you don't have the kinesthetic seat of your pants feel that's so important. It's going to give you the feel for your airplane. So.